Brother Lonnie Hastings is the father of our next speaker, Brother Andy Hastings. We still count Andy as a part of spring. He's been gone for quite a long time. I noticed um, all the time he was here, he was a bachelor. A bachelor. And as soon as he left, he married. I don't know what that means. Probably means nothing. It sounded good to say it. Andy has worked as a designer, and his new spring clothes will be out. No, it's not. Wrong kind of design. <laughs> As art director and a designer in the field of advertising for some 23 years, he currently lives in Stockdale, Texas with his wife, Linda, and two wonderful children, Caleb and, how do you pronounce it, Candice? Candice. He's taught Bible classes ranging from junior high to adult. He taught here along that line and has preached from the pulpit periodically over 16 years. His family, including his parents, who I've already mentioned, Lonnie and his mother, Bernice, established a new congregation in the Lord, of the Lord's Church in their home in, in a rural community of Nakanut, which has just passed its one-year anniversary. And you can read several religious articles that Andy has written on their website, which is nktchurchofchrist.org, all of it together, nktchurchofchrist.org. He's going to be speaking on what is always a troublesome part of godly living among some people, and that is dancing and in modest apparel. Let's listen to Brother Andy as he presents this good lesson. Brother Andy, come speak to us. First off, I'd like to thank David and the elders for inviting me to speak today. I consider it a great honor. I remember when I was a, a member here over a decade ago and sitting here in, in, these, in these pews listening to the, the great knowledge and wisdom being preached from this pulpit, I never dreamed that one day that I would be asked to uh, be up here and, and present a lesson as well. Um, I have to admit it's a bit intimidating to think about it, but it's a, it's a very great uh, honor and privilege as well to be asked. Um, but it's really great uh, every time we come back here to visit with y'all, to be back with um, our great Christian friends. Um, so many of you here we, we feel very close to, and, and especially with, with my family and, and uh, my young kids. they really enjoy being around uh, a lot of people their own age again, which you guys have a lot of here. Um, I'd like to extend a, a big thank you to Jean and Joy Litke for um, their hospitality and opening their house to us. And also on behalf of my family, I'd like to thank all of you for the encouragement that you are to us. And um, we ask your prayers, as, as David just mentioned, as we continue to work to grow this, this new congregation that we've established in uh, Rural, the rural Nakanut area um, of Texas. <clears throat> Who told you that you were naked? Adam was asked of God after he and his wife ate of the forbidden fruit in Genesis chapter 3, verse 11. Today, many in the world need to be told that they're naked. They have completely abandoned God's standard of, of morality in general, and not to mention his, his moral standard of modesty. Many in the church are confused about what the Bible have to, has to say about modesty, if they even care anymore. For those who genuinely do care about God's guidance in this matter, need to ask, what does the Bible have to say? <clears throat> is there a standard? If there is a standard, then how is it, looking from that standard, how do we define modesty? <clears throat> Concerning a question posed to our Lord about marriage and divorce, the master teacher skipped over the law of Moses and went back to the very beginning of time 
where the very foundational principle of marriage was established and said, have you not read? He who made them at the beginning made them male and female. The standard being one man, one wife for life. Concerning the question of modesty, we can use this example from the master teacher and reply, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made for them tunics? Adam and Eve lost their innocence in the Garden of Eden because of their sin, and they became vividly aware of their nakedness, as we read in Genesis 3, verses 6 through 7. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. These coverings that they made for themselves out of these fig leaves comes from the Hebrew word hagaroth, which is translated today would be like girdles or an apron. Um, think of the Tarzan loincloth. That's basically what they had made for themselves, sewing these fig leaves together. And God would say, this was not enough. This was not enough covering for you. And in Genesis 3.21, we read, For Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God clothed Adam and Eve with, some translations say, coats. But the Hebrew word, kethoneth, literally means tunics. And many people, they read over this. They read over this very quickly. And in their mind, they translate it as, so God made some clothes for them so they wouldn't have to keep wearing these leaves anymore. And that's basically what happened. And then they move on. God just made them some better clothes. But um, this, this verse, this one little verse in the book of Genesis at the very beginning is much more significant than that. This is our foundational standard for modesty. This is the basic minimal baseline for all time. To get a proper picture of what is described here, we only need to find out what the ancient Hebrew tunic looked like. When Moses used this specific word, kathoneth, here in Genesis 3.21, the earliest forms of tunics of the ancient Middle East were made of a rectangular piece of cloth that many times would be folded in the middle and then stitched up along the sides, leaving some holes at the top for the arms and then a cutout at the top for the head. And sometimes even just two rectangular pieces sewn together basically to make the, um, the same design, stitched up at the sides, leaving the, the holes for the arms and a hole for the, the head. These tunics covered from the shoulder to the knee, basically a long shirt. And they would be used later, the, 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 the term tunic was used for quite a long time and it would become an undershirt for more decorative or even heavier outer garments that would be worn over it. Later renditions would include long sleeves um, and eventually ladies versions would extend down to the ankles, but this first Ancient Hebrew tunic would become the minimum standard for modesty. Anything that reveals more than this, God uses the word nakedness. Also, we need to keep in mind that this was the very first animal sacrifice. Just like the blood of Christ covers our sin when we obey the gospel, something innocent had to give its life to make these tunics of skin. Where did the skin come from? It is the skin of an animal. Something had to give its life, something innocent that did not sin like Adam and Eve did. And if it was large enough, a large enough animal, possibly one animal for each of them to, to cover Adam and Eve's nakedness. Here's a sample of swimsuits from the early 1900s, early American 1900s. Many, many people 
would mock these swimsuits now as they use terms like old-fashioned or prudish or just, you know, just plain crazy. Why would somebody wear that to swim in? Um, but comparing them with the passages that we've just read, the, the tunics that God made for Adam and Eve, we can see that even up until the early 1900s in American culture, that we had a much keener sense of public modesty that aligned closer to God's definition of modesty than it does today. Say hello to Mr. Frog. Frogs don't know they're naked. And it's okay for us to look at naked frogs. <laughs> so, because of this, Mr. Frog is going to be a model for us to demonstrate for us some examples of modest and immodest apparel so we can take the principle from God's word and, and look at some examples today and, and see how they align with, with what we commonly see today. These tunics that God made, this is, this is if, if, if a tunic was designed for a frog, according to its definition, this is what it would cover. Um, and we have to keep in mind that these tunics were made to conceal, conceal Adam and Eve's nakedness. Any apparel that technically covers the same area but does not conceal is still considered immodest. Uh, for example, transparent or sheer clothing or, or even apparel that gives a, a shrink-wrapped effect that maybe looks like it was painted on. It's just so tight. It, kinda, it defeats the purpose because it doesn't conceal. Um, Think of like spandex shorts for bicycling, um, some types of athletic wear. Um, they, they defeat the purpose. We see teenage girls at almost any congregation I've been at, of, even in the Lord's Church of, of any significant size, somewhere there, there's, there, we see teenage girls wearing jeans that, that would fall in this category, just way too tight. Here's an example Using Mr. Frog, we'll go through a bunch of these. Some examples of things that the world would consider normal. There's nothing wrong with. This is completely modest, but we need to keep in mind with what we just looked at, at God's standard, of what that tunic would cover. Things like, you know, the bikini. The bikini is obvious. That's, it just, it's probably one of the pieces of apparel that just reveals the most without, you know, really getting into something um, just totally debaucherous. Um, swim shorts for guys. I mean, the shorts themselves cover the knee and they're fine and they're modest, but if you're in, you know, mixed, um, you know, boys and girls together going without the shirt, it's, it's still immodest. The, the one-piece bathing suit for, for the girls, it, it still doesn't cover enough. It's still skin tight. Um, then we get into some clothing like spaghetti strap shirts. Look how much it reveals at the top. It's designed to be you know, uh, a bit more alluring, and the reason why is because it's, it's immodest. Even tank top shirts, for this applies to girls and boys. They're fine for undershirts, but they're not fine for your main shirt. It just, it reveals too much. Um, then we even, you know, we see some blouses that have like an open back. Um, you know, those, they're not, they're not covering what the tunic would cover. Midriff. This is very popular, especially with the younger girls, showing the belly button off. You know, many of them get their belly button pierced with something to even draw your attention to it now after they expose it. Um, low, you know, <laughs> Mr. Frog was very accommodating uh, for some of these. Um, the, the low straps, you know, the, it, from the waist down, you know, very, very, very conservative and covering, but the top, you know, it just is designed to be alluring and revealing, and especially the, the, the strapless with the shoulders totally exposed and, and most of the times these types of dresses are designed to really accentuate cleavage. Um, this is one we're starting to see more of is uh, and, uh, even some girls in the church they use it as kind of a cheat where they'll wear s s spandex pants and then a short dress. Um, the spandex pants to try to get away with wearing a short dress but again we just looked at the, the, the spandex pants there's nothing wrong with wearing spandex pants as long as you're wearing something over it that's long enough to cover. 
But if you're using it as a cheat and you're, you're still wearing the short dress, it's, it's not covering, it's not being modest like we should. And then, you know, the thing that we, we talked about before going to summer camp, you know, the summer camp was mentioned um, earlier. We always got to talk to the kids about wearing shorts that are modest. And, you know, the short shorts, they just, they don't go down to the knee, they're not covering what they should. And then this one was mentioned also, the cheerleading outfit. Um, and, and really, I, I can't think of any instance where it would be okay for a, a Christian girl to want to be a cheerleader. Uh, the only time I think I've ever seen modest apparel is when, you know, maybe the colleges have special uniforms for when they're playing a game in sub-zero temperatures. Usually then they're covered up appropriately, um, but normally not. It's, the apparel is immodest, and the moves that they make to sh flip the apparel up when they kick their legs, it's, it, people look at that and they think, oh, that's fine and dandy, that's just American cu culture. It, it's designed to be alluring and, and really debasing these high school girls, and they don't even realize what they're allowing their kids to be put through with this. <clears throat> this stuff is not rocket science. It's people that object to it, it basically just comes down to our own stubborn will and what we want to do versus God's will. And, and it's up to us to make the decision, how do we want to view this subject? Some people, they try to push the limit um, in the church. They try to push their limits when selecting their clothing and, and wear clothing that, that may be modest only if they never actually have to move in it. Um, you know, we need to plan ahead and make sure that we remain modest, um, taking into account the things that we're going to have to do throughout a normal day. The Levitical priests in the Old Testament, they were given special instructions to think ahead and plan for things like this. In Exodus chapter 28, verse 42, God instructed, And you shall make for them linen trousers to cover their nakedness. They shall reach from the waist to the thighs. In modern language, we would translate this and say that this needs to reach from the waist down to the knee. Um, the, the, the same idea um, in ancient language, like, for example, the hand and the wrist, they didn't have specific language when talking about that sort of thing. Usually when they talk about the hand, it would include the wrist. So when we read about Jesus being nailed to the cross through the hand, most likely it was through the wrist where it would have been able to to hold the weight of the human body up like that is how the Romans would have done it. it. It's not inaccurate to say the hand, that's just the way they communicated back then. So to say the thigh would have included the knee as well, just like the hand included the wrist. And God said that these trousers, if they did not cover this, like if they were to go up the stairs or the wind was to blow or something and blow their tunic up, for them to still remain Modest, and he uses the term to cover their nakedness. An exposed thigh, short shorts, an exposed thigh is nakedness. <clears throat> and thinking about these, these trousers that the Levitical priests were instructed to wear, Marilyn Monroe, y'all seen the famous photo with the, the dress being blown up from the sewer grate. Um, if she would have taken the Levitical priest, the, the admonition to make these trousers just in case to hide her nakedness, the, this PR stunt for that famous photo, um, probably all you old people, it's, it's, part of, it's part of pop culture now. We've seen it so much. Um, it would not have been nearly as popular a photo and would not have been as such a successful PR stunt to promote her movie. But this is the basic idea for those trousers to remain modest, even when you normally would be wearing something that would cover to think ahead for your clothing to move. If we wear shorts or, or a dress, that um, we need to make sure it remains modest after we sit down, that, that when we sit, the idea is to cover, cover to the knee. And if when we sit, it comes up and reveals the thigh, it, it, it it's, it's, it's modesty counts no matter what we're doing, not just if we're standing still and no wind is blowing. Ladies, if you wear blouse, um, uh, a simple thing just to check uh, before you leave the house is to 
look in the mirror and lean over and think whatever you see is whatever someone else is going to see standing in front of you if you drop your keys or you have to bend over to pick up a kid or whatever it is. We need to think ahead of how we move and how our clothing does things that otherwise m might be fine. But if we got to do something, lean a different direction, becomes immodest. Um, and, and really, for, for you women, I, I feel for you. I understand. Um, I'm, I'm married to one. I know, <laughs> I know that it is difficult to go shopping, especially in the summer and the spring, and trying to buy clothes off the rack when it's designed by people of the world to, to be immodest. Um, sometimes it, the, the shopping can be real difficult, but you know, there, there's things that you can do if you just kind of think creatively, and I'm sure a lot of you do this. My wife does this trick. is like, like maybe there's a low-cut cut blouse, just augment it with something that is going to be tight and close and high so that it's not revealing. There's, there's ways and things you can do to make what would be immodest clothing modest, and just the idea of, of layering. Layering's not just a winter thing. If we have to do it in the summer, too, to remain modest, then that's what a Christian has to do. And, and really, fellas, we're not off the hook either. Um, does, does the term plumber's crack mean anything to a lot of you? I mean, there's so many jokes about that, but that's, that's immodest. That's, that's immodest. It's, it's like the woman who doesn't plan ahead for, you know, revealing herself if she has to just do something innocent. Um, you know, men, let, let's wear our shirts long enough and let's wear our pants high enough and, you know, let's be sure to plan ahead for that. Um, younger guys playing basketball, shirts and skins out in the open. You know, if it's just guys alone and you're in a closed gym that's locked and no women are going to walk in there, you know, that, that's fine. But if you're in an open lot and, and there's in a park, shirts and skins, that's not modest. That's, that's not for the Christian to do. Um, working in the yard, you know, just taking the shirt off to mow the grass. If you're out in the country and you, you're on 20 acres and you're right in the middle, there's nobody there, that's probably fine. But if, you know, you're on a busy street, which a lot of us are, mowing your yard with the shirt off, that's, that's not modest. But it's considered normal by the world. And, and really what it comes down to, it just comes down to having proper discretion. In Proverbs chapter 11, Verse 22, there's a description here of a jewel of gold in the nose of a pig <laughs> is equated to a beautiful woman without discretion. Think about that picture for a moment. You know, we, we look at the magazines and the advertisement of, oh, here's alluring, here's a beautiful woman, but, but she's just completely immodest. And the Bible says, that woman who has no discretion is exactly like a, a, a beautiful jewel that's stuck in the nose of a pig who has no care for that what's the value of it and is going to go wallow in the mud. And that's what the person has no discretion for their own modesty is equated to. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 27 through 28, we're warned, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is already a temptation to so many. Why would you want to wear something to create an even bigger stumbling block for the people who would look at you? The world would hear this stuff and think, this, this material I'm presenting right now, and think this is, this is just crazy. This is extreme. But if you put people in the right situation, um, even people of the world can agree on what biblical true modesty is and is not. You remember several years ago when the Somali pirates, they were hijacking these cruise ships um, off of the coast of Africa. And one of these instances, they took control of one of these ships and it was, you know, these women were out in bikinis lounging out. They immediately went and covered themselves up so that they would not give these pirates any extra ideas um, while they had control of this ship. Why would they do such a thing? Why, why would they think differently then when the pirates had control of the ship to cover themselves up? Because they knew, they knew in their heart that what they were wearing was causing thoughts 
in the minds of those men that were on that ship. And then when the people on that ship who actually had no regard for the law and were prepared and willing to do anything they wanted, they then went and, and covered themselves up properly. It tells you that if put in the right situation, people can make the right decision. They just have to be put in the right situation. The liberals will argue that modesty is only defined by the modern culture in which we live in order to excuse themselves from any static standard. Well, the standard is always changing. It's whatever is acceptable in the culture. Well, God's baseline standard, his, his baseline standard for all time, it never changes. But there is a sense in which current cultural customs can change in a limited way. For example, we read about um, Tamar in Genesis chapter 38, verses 14 through 15. And Tamar, so she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. Now here we see that Tamar's clothing and the way that, the way that she prepared herself telegraphed something about her character to Judah. And, and really, in this instance, she was probably covered up even more than what the basic Hebrew tunic. Here, here she covered herself even, he didn't even recognize her face because she put a veil on. But yet, by doing that, she allowed him to think that she was a woman of, of lesser character. And then earlier in history, we see when Rebecca saw her groom Isaac for the first time, that she covered her face with a veil to show her modesty. In Genesis chapter 24, verse 65, which to me it indicates here that through time and even not a very long period of time that current cultural customs or maybe even just geographic areas of where they were Customs can change, but it but these customs they did not they they did not and they cannot supersede God's baseline standard, and we need to keep that in mind today as as we think about um, this application. Well, what is an example of a modern day application of of this? And I I, I tried to come up with a new and different um, illustration for this, but I thought you know it. I've heard this so many times, all of you have heard it, I'm just going to do it again, that the idea of if a lady carries a red purse and that red purse tells everyone around her that she's a prostitute, you know, it's, it's should a Christian woman wear the red purse? It's not even the Christian woman, it's no woman should wear the red purse because it's not, modesty just doesn't apply to a Christian, it applies to everybody. But the Christian, of all people, should be aware of it and be the example that we should be to the rest of the world. Just like God's marriage, marriage law, his law on marriage and divorce, the basic standard of it, even though what a marriage ceremony, what is considered when you are married um, by the ceremony, whether it's breaking a glass on the floor or jumping over a broomstick or just having uh, a sermon or a captain of a ship pronounce you man and wife, you know, those customs can change, but God's basic standard of marriage and divorce does not change. Well, that's the same for modesty. There are some custom things that are, that are accepted as immodest, but the basic standard does not change. So we can see that sometimes we can be associated with the wrong crowd simply by what we wear or how we adorn ourselves. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Paul instructed in light manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array. The principle that women in particular should be modest in their appearance. We might say, it was not saying don't wear braided hair, don't, don't wear jewelry. What it's saying is don't be, don't be gaudy, don't be... Um, do yourself up so much so that you stand out in a loud way. Uh, we might say, don't be a show-off. 
And considering this principle of, of don't being a show-off, don't do things to stand out in a loud way, what about this question? Is a tattoo modest? Is, where, is a, wearing a tattoo, is that considered modest? It's becoming widely acceptable, and we're seeing it more and more um, in today's culture. But if you go back in time, what type of people started wearing tattoos? Well, superstitious people from pagan cultures that knew not God. They were the ones that really wore the tattoos for the most part. And then later on, pirates who went and visited these um, far-off pagan cultures that knew not God. And then we move up to today, getting closer, prison inmates or gang members. Those were the ones you would see wearing the tattoos mostly, or we would think like biker gangs, you know, back in the 70s, you know, those types of people. And, and now, as, as we move forward and get up in today, basically it's just people who want to be considered a bad boy. Uh, how many of you remember Dennis Rodman? I, I, to this day, I still cannot believe that for five minutes he was a member of the San Antonio Spurs. Um, but, you know, look at him with the colored hair and the, and the tattoos. That was part of his whole thing was he wanted, he wanted to stand out and he wanted to make a name for himself. And, and really, people today, what are they doing when they get the tattoo? They're trying to say, I'm a little bit of a rebel. I'm, you know, or somebody, they say, well, I, I want to commemorate something. Well, really, where does that come from? Um, I think the popularity of the tattoo today is a bit like the long hair of the 60s. It, it stems from a, a rebellious attitude, or at least it, it originally did. And, and there's a name. There's a name for a tattoo that some young women get, and they have it put across uh, above the, 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 their derriere in the back so that when they bend over, their shirt rises a little bit, and then it's exposed. And there's a name for it. It's called a tramp stamp. And this term, this tramp stamp, it wasn't invented by women. Guys came up with this name. Guys, guys came up with the term tramp stamp um, because it telegraphs something to them about the character, or if not the character, at least the perceived character of the person, of the woman that's wearing it. In most cases, she even gets the tattoo put there as an advertisement, hence the term tramp stamp. Um, there are still many companies today who will not hire you, even though the, the, these standards are becoming more relaxed, but there's still a lot that, that won't hire people if they have exposed tattoos. You'll need to wear a long sleeve shirt or something to cover them up. And if they come in a way that that, that can't hide it, they, they won't hire you still. Why do they do that? Well, it, it, it sends a message. It, it sends the wrong message that they want their company to be, to be represented that way. And, and I understand that some people, they get tattoos before they obey the gospel. Um, they get them when they're young, before they think about it, and then you know, they learn about it later, and they're like, well, here I am with these tattoos. Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to say that those people are in sin from, from wearing the tattoos. And, and many times, some of them, after they become a Christian a while, and they become a bit embarrassed by it. But the main question is for the younger, you younger kids that would be contemplating getting one, you know, after looking at this, the question is, why, why would you contemplate getting one? Is it to fit in with the crowd? Is it to be like the people, other people wearing them? It's like, what is that group that's wearing them? Why do you want to fit in to that crowd? If you want to stand out, why don't you not get one and stand out that way? Um, and also, as we consider this, we need to consider what's, what's said in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 28. The Israelites were warned about being like the pagan Gentiles around them, and they were commanded, do not print on yourselves, which was one of the things pagan cultures did. Some translations will say tattoo. And the Bible tells us that symbolically, our bodies are the temple of God. And considering that, why would we want to put the equivalent of this on our body? Dancing is immodest. Dancing is nothing more than immodesty in motion. It is immodest movement of the body. And when I say dancing, I'm not talking about just a blanket statement, all dancing in general. 
there are some dances that can be fine and, and actually condoned by the Bible if you are, first of all, modestly covered and, and your dance doesn't do movements that suggest something Im immoral or suggestive to the viewer and it not, does not entail the, the unchaste handling of someone from the opposite sex. If you can fit that category, then the dancing's fine. But what we're talking about is when people go to the clubs, they go to the nightclubs, they go to the school prom, and they engage in these dances, and what we see involved there with the music involved, it's immodest. What makes dancing immodest? Well, first of all, dancing is lasciviousness. In the King James, it's lasciviousness. In the New King James, it's, it's lewd. In Galatians 5.19, in the New King James, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness. Webster defines lewd as given to indulgence of lust, suiting or proceeding from unlawful sexual desires. This, this can be a description of the dance. Um, dancing is also revelry. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 21, it describes envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Things like this, even. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. What is revelries? The 20th century dictionary describes revelry as a, a feast with noisy jollity, carouse, spectacular dance performed in procession and pageant. Um, Thayer's Greek lexicon describes it as a nocturnal and riotous procession of half-drunken and frolicsome fellows who after supper parade through the streets with torches and music in honor of Bacchus or some other deity and sing and play before the houses of their male and female friends, hence used generally of feast and drinking parties. The, these dances are always, unless it's a school prom where they don't allow the alcohol, generally any other dance is going to be a big drinking party um, that are protracted till late at night and indulge in revelry. In Mark chapter 6, verse 23, we read about um, this dance performed by Herod's daughter. Actually, it doesn't say Herod's daughter, it says Herodias' daughter most likely Herod's stepdaughter, since after all, John the baptizer had told him, you cannot have your brother's wife. This was probably his brother's daughter. Perform some sort of oriental exotic dance before Herod and his, his guest at a drunken party, hence revelry. And he got so excited, Herod did, by this dance that was performed um, by the woman he was staying with, by her daughter, that he offered up to half his kingdom whatever the girl would request. And the end result ending in the head of John the baptizer, which the mother had enticed her because of what John had told Herod and Herodias, that it, they were living in sin, living together, not according to God's marriage law. Here is an instance where someone just watching a dance, an inappropriate dance, inappropriate, immodest movement, not even participating with the girl, uses poor judgment and the bad outcome that results from it. You, you go back and you look statistically in history, girls, um, nowadays it's probably for other reasons, just because the standards are so relaxed, but back when the country had stricter standards, you go back and you look, many times the unwed pregnancies occurred after a dance. Why would that happen? Because your judgment, you, you start to make bad decisions when you, your mind gets excited by the way the things that go on at these dances. Take the music away from the dance and what do you have? Uh, husbands and fathers, if some stranger were to come up and take your wife on the street and start, or your daughter, and start performing these same moves that we would see in a dance club, these close movements and rubbing against each other and these gyrations and the handling of all that. Probably, after you punch them in the mouth, you would probably have some sort of child charges filed against them 
for molestation. Yet, you take the music away, and, and people think it's perfectly fine. It's like the music is some sort of covering or a cloak that hides the sin of these lascivious movements um, within a setting of revelry that, that, that makes the, don the modern dance permissible to so many. Take the music away and remove them from the setting of the dance hall, and what do you have? Let's really take the music away. What do you have? Women. How many of you would allow your husbands or your sons to make such sexually explicit gestures and unchaste fondling with the opposite sex on the street. But so many, even within the church, have no problem with those exact movements being performed within the, the darkness of the dance hall with the music playing, and somehow the, mu the music playing makes it just fine. I'm, I'm reminded of a television commercial a while back I think it's still playing. I think I saw it pretty recently. For Febreze Air Freshener. There's these blindfolded people and they're smiling blissfully in this room filled with trash. And supposedly the Febreze Air Softener, it's, it's so, it's, it, it does such a great job of masking the odor that they think they're in this clean room and everything's just fine. And in the same way, the music, the presence of the music to so many it, is, is, it makes them blind to the odorous sin and trashiness of the modern dance and what goes on there, that having the music there normally otherwise would not, would not think those movements permissible, but the music makes it okay. The Christian is to be modest in all things. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 2 through 8, we read, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust, like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such." as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. Therefore, he, rejects, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Thank you for your kind attention. That wasn't a whip behind anybody's sermon Amen. on the truth on that matter. Andy, it was good to hear you. I haven't heard you in years, and I appreciate so much your ability and dedication. And that lesson was, anybody here have any problem at all understanding it that are capable of understanding? Just remember fraud, and you'll remember all that needs to be done. Uh, now, the thing about it is, this sermon's worthless if mom and daddy, as far as the home's concerned, don't teach and train and correct. Sometimes that means against their will you make them do what you want them to do and then try to show them why. That's all part of what the home's all about. And then when it comes down to the Lord's church, all of us who stand publicly to teach, to rebuke, to exhort, we have an obligation to uphold this or else we wouldn't have had this lesson in this whole series. And it behooves all in the church to help everybody else in the church as their brothers and sisters in the family of God to be modest in every way. I think we ought to realize that everything he said here today comes from an honest heart. Have we heard anything about that this morning? It comes from a modest attitude that wants to be godly and understanding then from God's Word what it is to be godly in every part of your conduct. And as an encouragement to our elders and other elders that are here, as far as the church is concerned, as far as the teaching of the Bible on shepherding the family of God, it sure doesn't hurt a thing if elders go up and remind parents of their duty and remind kids of their duty, even as I am now and as has been preached this morning. And if people rebel 
rebel, rebel. There is the need, even as is in the home, for corrective discipline prescribed in the divine pattern of God's infallible word that will judge us all on the last day. Now, that's not nearly it, folks. That's it. That's the plain truth on these matters. And you can not like it. You can rebel against it. And it won't change a thing you heard this morning from God's word, the divine pattern on modesty. We believe in a divine, infallible blueprint or pattern for the church and its organization, work, and worship. And in the five steps, that's where we delineate them so people understand it. And in the five steps in the plan of salvation and all the details in that, it also means there's a divine pattern of authority, and that's the way Andy began, as to what is modest from God's perspective and what is not. And if we can understand that, we know what we ought to be doing. And when we don't do it, what is it, brethren? It's sin, and that's all there is to it. Don't mix it. Don't say, well, so-and-so's attitude is bad about it, and they need to correct something else over here. That may be so. Well, fine, correct it over here. But this matter right here needs to be corrected. That's just where it is. So we thank you, Andy. That needs to be kept before us nowadays with this perverse society in which we're in as much as anything I can think of about what it is to be a godly person in every way possible. We're going to stand dismissed, but let's wait for just a moment because we have to give the ladies time to get back there and get everything set up. And here in just a moment, we're going to uh, go to our Heavenly Father and